We are involved in a series. We've done three videos so far. And the purpose of this series, really, it's for believers, especially, who are tired of all of the conflicting views we have on the end times, on the Lord's return. And so we noted that prophecy is very much like putting a jigsaw puzzle together. The Bible is the box and the individual prophecies are scattered throughout the Bible. They're not in any particular order. And so the challenge is to take the prophecies and with the help of the Holy Spirit, using the analogy of a jigsaw puzzle, put the pieces together in such a way that they ultimately build the puzzle and get a complete picture the picture that the Lord himself wanted us to see from the very beginning. Uh, I believe that this puzzle was solved by the New Testament apostles that eventually they understood how the prophecies should go together. After all, eight of them were entrusted to write the New Testament so that we could have it in our day, use that and complement it with the Old Testament and see the same picture. So we noted that really what we need to do since we have our generation has received so many views from prior generations rather than just try to prove which one is right and which ones are wrong i've noted i don't think anybody's entirely right and i don't think anybody's entirely wrong so what we want to do is bring a new approach which is let's start from scratch let's start over Let's rebuild the puzzle with the help of the Holy Spirit, which really is the same way the New Testament apostles had to do it, because like us, they had no, no clue at the beginning either. So the approach is to take what is most easily seen, the fundamental truths that as pieces of a puzzle, you find a few pieces and you know they have to go together, and then you build around that. So in the prior videos, we found some fundamental pieces and we realized they have to go together. The way or the approach that God used to help us begin the solution of the puzzle is he gave us a phrase in the last days and we found that that was a setup because the phrase can only be understood as days in his sight or a thousand year days. We call that the last days. Now, by the very nature of the phrase, we also know that if you have last days, then you have to have some days of equal length that go before them for them to be the last days. They have to be the last of something. That led us into a revelation that is very abundant in God's word, and that is that there is a great week of thousand-year days, and in that context, God has predetermined the entire plan of redemption to play out, to be accomplished within what I like to call the great prophetic week of God. Now, that was just another step. So we're going through a progression here. We're finding a couple of pieces and we found the last days and then we found a piece that gives us a concept, a great week. And the purpose in that was to really focus our attention on the last day of that week because Jesus said something very important concerning that last day and that was that he connected the last day with resurrection. He who believes on me, I will raise him up at the last day. We found that was important. Once we found that piece and had a general context of what the puzzle should look like. It should have something to do with thousand year days and with a great week of thousand year days. Now we take this last day and we realize it's not only the last day of this great week, but that in turn makes it the seventh day. And since Paul and Jesus both were speaking about resurrection, we now have two pieces, the common link being resurrection that have to go together. And when we did that, we found that what Jesus and Paul are telling us is that the Lord will come, the rapture will happen when that last or seventh day begins. That was a crucial piece to put together because 
in spite of what we've heard and learned in the past, remember there's a demo day when you start rebuilding, you have to sometimes pull the puzzle apart and scatter the pieces again to start over and start from scratch. So the first thing we really saw concretely when we put a couple of pieces together was that the rapture will, be, will occur as this seventh day begins. That means it can't be an event that could happen at any moment as we previously understood. Instead, you must have six days of equal length. They must transpire before you can come to that seventh day. Interestingly, our generation is living at a time in which we're soon approaching the end of the 6,000 years from Adam. So this is why it's very significant to us. I believe that's why God wants it restored, this puzzle rebuilt, and these things made clearly known to the body of Christ. He doesn't want to leave us, he doesn't want his bride in confusion before her wedding day, right? So that's why this is so important. We also then took another step, added another part of the puzzle. You know, when you're building a puzzle, you the rule is, as you probably well know, you look for pieces that have similar markings, similar colors, similar shapes. When you find them, that's, that's how you know they go together. In our case, we look for key truths that fundamentally go together, such as resurrection. You're looking at pieces involving resurrection and his coming and the rapture. And when Jesus linked that with the last day, we found that was a prophetic expression tying in to the great week and the last days in the way he's wanting us to understand the term. So now we've got a significant start to the puzzle and we just want to keep building. So we saw again that the last day or seventh day is also called the day of the Lord. Now that opened up and, and caused us to, now we can look for a number of other pieces. Now we know what kind of pieces to look for because anything that we find written about the day of the Lord means we're looking at this last and seventh day. When that day begins, the rapture will occur. So the significant thing about that is that the day of the Lord has plenty of information about it in the Bible. We are told which events will happen before that day begins. We are told which events will happen after that day begins. Not only that, but the day of the Lord has plenty of signs. And so that means, since it's connected to the rapture, that the rapture has plenty of signs. That means it's not only not an event that could happen at any moment, you must wait for the seventh and last day, it's also an event that has plenty of signs. We've been told it's a signless, secret, any moment event. Really, when you start rebuilding the puzzle with New Testament truth, the truth that the New Testament apostles clearly understood, then we have to tear some of that down and throw it out. Irregardless of whether we understand it exactly, you won't until you build more of the puzzle. So in this lesson, it's going to be a little bit different because I'm going to do a little bit more teaching and refer to my notes because this part is so critical. So I'm going to be uh, looking more at my notes, but that's okay. You don't need to watch me the whole time. And just listen to the scriptures because we're going to cover a number of them. And actually, in this lesson, we're going to look at some of the fundamental basic truths that the Bible tells us about the day of the Lord so we can start putting the pieces as they should be placed. And then in the next lesson, we'll probably look at the signs leading up to the day of the Lord. Bear in mind, now we know to say not only leading up to the day of the Lord, but leading up to the rapture. This is so significant. So. The first thing I want to bring to your attention, the basic truths now is what we'll do in this lesson concerning the day of the Lord. And first of all, I think the best place to begin is to note that it's the day of the Lord, not a day of the Lord. There's not many day of the Lord's because there's only one seventh day, only one last day. 
So the New Testament apostles had that view. To them, the day of the Lord was a specific prophetic term, and it was something that remained in their future. They were looking for it to come. They didn't, like many scholars today, think that there were many days of the Lord in the past. When you find something in the Old Testament about the day of the Lord, very often you're looking at a near and far event. You know, prophecy is a strange creature to the Western mind because we think everything should just be linear and right in sequential order. But prophecy is very different. Prophecy can use a near event, and because it's like something that's going to happen in the future, in this case, the day of the Lord, you'll find the expression, the day of the Lord, that event is not necessarily the fulfillment of the day of the Lord. It's just like it, and so prophecy will often like two mountain peaks, show you what's here and then show you something that looks like they're right together, but really there's a great valley of time in between. So just understand this, that the New Testament apostles always viewed the day of the Lord as something that was yet to come. Uh, another aspect of the day of the Lord that we want to look at, and these are just building blocks so that when we find the day of the Lord, we know enough about it to know where it should go in the puzzle. The second thing is that the day of the Lord is not called the night of the Lord. So what do you mean by that? Well, in Genesis, the pattern was there's an evening and a morning, and God called that one day. So there's both darkness and light. And the, the truth there is that the day of the Lord is both a day of darkness and a day of light. It depends on whether you or I am in the darkness or in the light. If you're in the darkness, then it's going to be a day of darkness for you as it begins. There is the wrath of God associated with that day. But if you're a believer, here's where the comfort and the hope and the victory come in. If you're a believer, it's not a day of darkness for you. In fact, it's a day of salvation, a day of redemption. It's actually the spirit or let me say it like this, it's the birthday of your glorified body. That's why in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul says we are sons of the light, we're sons of the day. And that means that it's our birthing day. That's, you see, again, the connection. The last day, resurrection. The seventh day, resurrection. The day of the Lord, resurrection. So for us, it's not a day of doom and gloom. It's a day of the coming of the groom. And when he comes, he will raise up the dead in Christ, and we who are alive and remain will be changed instantly into immortality. So it's not the night of the Lord. It's the day of the Lord. Whether it's darkness or light depends on where you stand, whether you're in the kingdom of darkness or whether you've been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. I hope you're there. If not, just ask God Ask Jesus to come into your heart and believe what the gospel says about him, that he died for our sins, he came to redeem us, that we might receive forgiveness, healing, everything in the salvation package. Just ask him into your heart. That's, that's the simple prayer. Lord, come into my heart. I may not even understand who you are, but come into my heart and show yourself if you're real. That's a good prayer. <laughs> if you haven't prayed it, just pray it. Now, the next thing uh, about the day of the Lord that we want to know is the wrath of God is reserved for the coming of that day. That's an important point. So in Romans chapter 2, verse 5, it says, But in accordance with the hardness of your heart, your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath when? In the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. It's being treasured up for that day. God's not doing it right now, in other words. So 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 7 says the same thing. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. If you're beginning to see a pattern here, you'll, you'll realize that the New Testament apostles learned a great key, and that was God's day terms, days in his sight. And so everything revolved around that concept, that revelation. That's the way they spoke. 
That's why you can't find them talking about a pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, post-tribulation rapture. They didn't even think that way. They understood Daniel's 70th week, in fact, in a way that we haven't, but that's another lesson I've gotten way ahead of myself. But they understood everything in terms of the day. When he comes in that day to be glorified in us, to be admired by us, that's how they expressed his coming. That's how they expressed end time prophecy. Everything fit around this day, this last day, the seventh day, this day of the Lord. The promise to believers, and this is the next point, is that we will be delivered from the wrath of that day or the wrath to come. And so 1 Thessalonians chapter 1.10 says, And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Now how is he going to deliver us from a snare that comes upon the whole earth, an hour of trial? Well, he's going to catch us up to his Father's house, He's going to remove us from the earth in an event that I know sounds very spectacular and strange, but really, it's his plan, right? So, however you want to work the plan, you're the man. And he said, I'm going to descend from heaven and I'm going to take you off the earth and up to my father's house. Then that way, it's a timely deliverance, the rapture. And it's timely because it's just in the nick of time. That's why the word for caught up is harpazo, which means snatched, like you'd pull someone out from in front of an oncoming car. It's a timely deliverance because he does not want his church, bride, and body to be here during his wrath. We have, we're not appointed to that wrath. It says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, God did not appoint us to that wrath, but to obtain salvation, that's the new glorified body, the upgrade, through our Lord Jesus Christ. And the reason is that anyone in the world cannot, it has the ability, the, the promise to not be appointed to that wrath, but you have to receive his grace. You have to receive his forgiveness. You have to receive Jesus into your heart and be in Christ. If you're in him, you see the wrath can't fall on him. And so if you're in him, then the wrath can't fall on you either. It would be unrighteous, unjust for God to let that happen. Now it's, it's our decision whether we step by faith into him or not. If you don't, then it's not his fault. He offered it to you. He gave you the gift. You just failed to receive it. He doesn't want you to go through that. I can tell you right now, he's not willing that anyone should perish. God loved the world. In fact, that's not even the right way to say it. I should, I dropped out a word. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe on him should not perish or have to go through these things. Amen. So the second or the second point of these two is that uh, even though his wrath is reserved for that day, when that day comes, that's why the rapture happens at that day, because we have not been appointed to that wrath by the simple fact that we are in Christ. And so he's going to come, and he was the first born from the dead. When he comes the next time, who gets resurrected at that point? Those that are his, that is coming. We're his. In one place he prayed, Father, they were yours, but you gave them to me. Man, we're given to Jesus like a bride is given from her mom and dad to this bridegroom. Praise God. So Jesus is very serious about his bride is not going to suffer these things. Now, uh, another point I want to make about the coming of the day of the Lord is that in Scripture, you'll find that His coming and the coming of that day are very often used interchangeably. And I think you can see why. Because He comes as that day begins. And the rapture happens as that day begins. And so you'll find Scriptures about the rapture, His coming. And then they'll, in the same passage almost, talk about the coming of the day of the Lord because you're looking at the same point in time. 
So in 2 Peter chapter 3, it says, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? Now in the same passage, a couple verses later, he says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. So for Peter, it was just as easily said the promise of his coming or the coming of the day of the Lord because he understood that the Lord will come as that day begins. He comes to begin his day in which he will be exalted, in which he will begin the process of putting every enemy underfoot. That includes the Antichrist. And if you're thinking, but I thought that the thousand year reign began after the Antichrist was destroyed. No, that violates the scripture. He must reign until all enemies are put underfoot. And so in Psalm 110, it said about Jesus, reign in the midst of your enemies. You see, God is going to begin his thousand year reign of treading and putting every enemy underfoot while these enemies are still on the earth. And he begins with the Antichrist and the false prophet and the armies that are coming against Israel. So that brings us to uh, another point that we need to make is that, as, as you've seen in Peter, the day of the Lord, his coming, the rapture, all come with thief-like surprise. Now here's the point, to those who do not watch, they do not need to come with thief-like surprise for believers who are watchful. What does that mean, to watch? Does it mean to go up on a mountaintop somewhere and keep gazing at the sky looking for something? No, it means to look down into his word and watch means to be attentive, to study, to investigate, to be alert and awake. When you are alert and awake and you study and investigate his word, you cannot be surprised because you'll find the signs leading up to his coming. You'll find all kinds of information that just like a pregnant woman, she knows the general length of time between conception and birth, the nine months. That's the equivalent of what we're being given here with the day of the Lord and the great week. And she knows the signs that indicate her pregnancy is moving along. And then she knows the final signs that a woman sees as the baby is just about to be born. And God has really given us the same two things. He's given us this great week and the last day, seventh day, day of the Lord, and all of the signs then that go with it, that precede it, so that just like the pregnant woman, we don't need to be supplied, uh, surprised. Jesus said, Take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with the cares of this life, and that day come upon you unexpectedly. It need not come upon you unexpectedly. You're a son of the day, a son of the light, and so if you're looking at things in the light, you're not going to be surprised. But those who are in darkness, oh, it's another story. They will be surprised. He will come like a thief in the night. They will not be expecting it. So. Here, both come with thief-like surprise, and we see that uh, in Revelation 16. Jesus said, Behold, I am coming as a thief. So he comes as a thief. Then in 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 and 2, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Someone might say, well, which is it? Is the Jesus coming as a thief or is the day of the Lord coming as a thief in the night? If you divide the two, then it's confusing, isn't it? That's why we've had so many different pictures of the puzzle. But when you start from scratch and you realize these are the same thing, the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night because when the day of the Lord begins, Jesus comes. And so since that's the same moment in time when one begins and Jesus comes and the rapture takes place, it can be said of all that they occur as a thief in the night. So we're seeing how not only does resurrection tell us which pieces go together, 
But when we find these truths, these key truths about the day of the Lord, and they're said also of his coming, that both link then together, which is what we would expect to sign to see if our initial pieces were properly placed. And they are, and now we're getting the proof and the confirmation of it. We would expect that both his coming, that Jesus would come as a thief in the night, that the day of the Lord would begin as a thief in the night, that you could use these terms interchangeably as the New Testament apostles did because that's the central truth. That the last day I will raise him up. What day? The seventh day. What day is that? It's called the day of the Lord. See how this works? Another point about the day of the Lord and his coming to show how intimately they are linked together, we should never, the church should never have divorced the two and made a secret, signless, any moment coming that was disconnected from the coming of that day. That's a serious violation of scripture. Your puzzle can never fit right. You'll never get the pieces to fit. You'll, it'll be a, a confusing mess if you violate this critical point in the puzzle. That's why I'm taking the time to really make sure I get the scriptures before you even if I can't look at the camera the whole time, I want you to get this. This is a critical point in building or rebuilding the end time prophecy puzzle is we cannot separate his coming and the rapture from the coming of the day of the Lord. If that means it's not an any moment event, so be it. If that means there's signs and so that it's not a signless event like we've been taught, then so be it. If we'll build the puzzle, eventually our questions will be answered and we'll see how everything fits together, okay? So as believers, we are looking for both the coming of the Lord and the coming of that day. Again, showing their, the, the link between the two. So in Titus 2.13, looking for the blessed hope. What is that? The glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. But what else are we looking for? Well, in Hebrews 10, 25, for instance, it says not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So we're not only looking for the blessed hope of Jesus appearing in clouds of glory and descending from heaven, but we know that at the same time, we're looking for the beginning of the day of the Lord, the start of that day. Uh, Another important point to show the link between these things is that as believers, his work in us will continue until that day. Now, if the day of the Lord was an event separate from his coming and the rapture, then we wouldn't be able to say that. But if the rapture and his coming coincide with the beginning or dawning of that seventh last day of the Lord, then you can see why his work would continue in us up until that day. So Philippians 1.6, for instance, says, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until, until when? Until the day of Jesus Christ. The day of Jesus Christ or the day of Christ is just a variation of the title, the day of the Lord. And so the reason why that good work that was begun in us, and I hope in you and trust in you too, that it will uh, continue and it will not be completed until the day of Jesus Christ is because that's that last seventh day after the day of the Lord comes, after the day of Christ comes, there will be no believers who need a continuation of that good work in them because by then we will be sanctified completely, spirit, soul, and body. Right now our spirit has been recreated and is brand new, recreated in the very image of Christ. Your soul is, and my soul, is in the process of being renewed, which it has to be to begin to think like him and see things like he sees. Our body is waiting for that day because then and only then will we receive the upgrade, will we receive a glorified body like unto his. And then at that point, we will be complete, spirit, 
soul, and body, nothing lacking. We will be conformed completely to the very image of Christ. We will see him as he is when he appears, and we will be like him. I'm looking forward to that. I hope you are too, but we still understand that before that happens, we have a lot of work to do. This is not a time to just sit around and wait and try to survive or wait for his coming, no. This is a time to get out into the fields and labor and bring in the harvest. And I'm hoping, I'm trusting that the whole point of these things is to show you that this is not a time to just squander away your life with the cares of this life. This is a time to get in the Word of God, to get and full of the Spirit of God and be about the Father's business. This is a time to seek Him with all of your heart, to seek His face and let Him uh, work through you in this hour. He wants to accomplish tremendous things. He wants to bring out your full potential in the years that remain. And by the way, we do have time before He comes according to what this revelation says to have a great move of God. There's plenty of time for that. And I believe it's already in process and it's just going to continue and gain momentum. But we have time for that. Just because Jesus is coming soon doesn't mean, oh, we quit making plans or we quit working. No, it's just the opposite. This is time to really get with it. Um, Philippians 1, 9 through 10, here's another verse about his work continuing us until that day. Paul said, I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ. Again, it's obvious, once that day comes, the day of Christ, the day of the Lord, there will be no occasion for us not to be insincere or for us to commit an offense. That's why Paul cut it off, said this one will only be true until that day comes, because once that day comes, that won't be a consideration anymore. You won't need to pray that for one another anymore. There will be no possibility of offending or of committing an offense. Praise God. Again, I'll give you one more, 2 Timothy 1, 12. For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and I am, this is Paul talking to Timothy, I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. Isn't it interesting that when you get the revelation of the last days, the great week, the last day, the sep that now all of these scriptures suddenly pop with meaning because we realize they were using these expressions based in the context of understanding these revelations. We've read them thinking it's just some day, some 24-hour day, whenever the day is that he comes. That's something that needs some demo work. We need to tear that down, sweep it up, move it out of the house, and put it in the trash container, and let's rebuild the right way. Now, as believers, there's another point. Our rewards and our cause for joyce, rejoicing are linked to that day. Again, here's 2 Timothy 4, 8, Paul speaking to Timothy. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. Crowns, rejoicing, good work. See how it all comes to either fruition or comes to a cutoff point when you come to the day of the Lord. We were so wrong to just take the rapture and make it some secret event and disconnect it from the coming of that day. That's why the puzzles are so difficult to put together. Now we have some firmly placed pieces that have the witness and the confirmation of the New Testament apostles. I know I refer to them, but what I really mean is who wrote what they learned and eventually saw and became our New Testament. So really, we're building on the foundation of biblical truth as revealed in the New Testament, as shown in type and shadow in the Old Testament, so that we have the whole counsel of God 
that is backing us up and saying, yes, those pieces go there. Build on that. <laughs>